So we're in week three of our new series, uh, Countercultural. We're in uh, verse four of Matthew chapter five. I got to hang out with my, my oldest son, his wife, and my amazingly beautiful granddaughter, Gemma Fleur. Friday. They had to go and they, they came by the house and we had to go pick up some stuff because in our brilliance with everything that Zan and I are going through, we decided to, or Zan's going through, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a spectator in it, that we decided to uh, remodel the house. So I'll help you. So those of you that are counselors, there are certain things that they tell you that you want to spread out, right? For if you're, if you're in the middle of crisis or in the middle of stress, you don't want to pile everything on your plate at once because what? Right, plate falls over. Well, because of where it's so smart, we decided that in the midst of this, this journey of, of chemo, okay, got an idea. Let's remodel the house. <laughs> so we're remodeling the house. Lucky us. So Friday we, had, we ordered a big, um, I ordered a, a, a big standalone baths, like pool-sized tub. It's gigantic because she's always wanted a tub. We've never had uh, a, a tub that she can soak in. It's like, hey, we'll put a five-piece bath in. We'll get a tub. So we, we went and picked that up. And, and, and I, Josh has a truck, and I had sold my truck and couldn't fit it in a Jeep because it's gigantic. And, and like, hey, dude, come over. So my granddaughter came over, and she's walking. <sighs> See, all you parents like, oh. Remember when they were that sweet? <laughs> And, we, and I, we have a garden, and so we brought her out in the garden, and I'm, I'm able to, to uh, feed her fresh strawberries, and she's mowing on the strawberries. And then my crazy lab, you know, that has no, he's worse than me, and so he's wagging his tail. He's beating her with his tail. And I'm like, I'm going to kill you, dog, but I can't kill you in front of my granddaughter because she'll be scarred for life, so I had to move her, him off. And, 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 and it makes you, when you're around those kind of kids and when you're around that age, you begin to remember what your own children were like when they were sweet, kind, and quiet. Put a smile on your face. And the reason I, I, I say this is like, my kids, my sons were, were perfect until they weren't. <laughs> And so I think some of you guys might have heard the story that I had pulled into the garage of, uh, of a house in Loveland. Oh, no, it was in Denver at the time. And I pull in, and I'm, I'm driving up the, the driveway, and we we're on a slope, and there's a two-car garage. And I'm like, why are there black marks on the driveway? And as any good dad does, like, what they do now? Right? You don't think that something died there. You think that your kid did something. So I'm driving up, and I park, and I'm like, there's like all these big, like, eight-inch circular splotches on the driveway. I'm like, mm, what'd you do? Then I pop the garage, walk in the garage, and I'm like, wow, there's all shotgun shells cut in half here. It's kind of an interesting perspective. So not only were the shot, and, and so I used to, I had a workbench and I had a vice, and so they, I, I saw one shotgun shell cut in half, with the brass clamped in the vise, and the wad was out, and the wad separated your, the, the um, black powder from the BB. I'm like, what have you been doing? And I started, take, I started connecting the dots, right? The black spots on the driveway were where my pyrotechnic sons and their friends had emptied the shotgun shell black powder and put it on the thing and went poof. And the BBs on the garage floor were from the things that they couldn't figure out what to do. So why sweep them up and hide them when you can, like, leave them there? <laughs> and the shotgun shell in the vise was there because there was a hammer next to it with a center point so they could fire the, the primer. I'm like, dear God. Now, as a parent, you get mad on a multitude of things. You get mad because you're like, you could have burned down the whole stupid house, you idiots. And then after you realize that your house is still standing and there's no fire that you can see in the garage, you begin to go, man, I hope they didn't lose a hand. And you begin to get more mad. 
Because like, I'm going to kill them because if they're not injured or dead or maimed, they're going to be shortly. <laughs> so I go in the house and they're like, like, hey, what, you want to tell me something? What? You want to tell me something? You got about two seconds. Well, we were just like, we, we took a, and they took a hacksaw to cut the plastic off of the, the shotgun shell between the brass and the plastic. And I'm like, you understand what could have happened? What? And they get mad at me. They'll, no, they get mad. And, and they're young enough now to start kind of, their eyes tear up. And they're not crying because of the pain or the worry that they caused me. They're crying because why? They got caught. Like, okay, next time we do it, we've got to sweep up before Dad gets home. He's going to freak out again. <laughs> we'll buy a little piece of plywood to light the black powder on it. We'll pitch the plywood. And they learn that from me. Right, I was, as a, as a kid, I, and when I was, and I'll tell you why I thought about all these things outside of uh, watching my, my granddaughter, but I remember when I was a kid, I went, instead of in the garage where sane, semi-sane boys do their evil, I was in the house by a kitchen that had a flame. Now, because I was a little, I guess, pyro, I had taken something and lit it on fire. and went, wow, look at the fire. And then it went, and in my brilliance, I threw it in a plastic trash can <laughs> that was filled with more paper, which to a kid, you're like, oh my gosh. Then in that caught on fire and the plastic trash can did what? Right? We're all scientists. We know that plastic at a certain degree begins to go and melts. And I start getting worried. Not because I almost burned the entire house down. Not because I freaked out and, you know, f could have killed all my brothers. Unintentionally. I freaked out because I'm like, how am I going to explain this melted trash can to my mom and dad? Oh, they're going to be mad. <laughs> you see, because a child doesn't have the capacity to see beyond their choices. A child only sees most of the time, and parents, you know this. A parent yearns for a child to have a grasp that their choices are causing pain to your hearts. Right? So, uh, and, but a child just like, how many times as a parent have you said, dude, just, how's it? It's just not that big of a deal. You know, it's going to be a big deal, and I, I'm going to make it a big deal for you. See, a child can only see what their, what their choices make on themselves as an individual and can't grasp the fact that their choices have affected and at times so hurt their parents. That makes sense? Does that make, are you kind of, kind of tracking with me, the two different things? So they can only see themselves. And as a parent, you yearn for the day that they see that their choices impact the world around them. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. So we better pray, and we'll, 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 we'll get at it. So if you have your Bibles, if you haven't already opened, um, it's on, all these notes are on Bible.com, so you can go there and see that. But Father, I thank you that um, you are a dad first and foremost, that you are a creator, that you are holy and righteous and just, but your word says that you are our Father in heaven. So I pray, God, as we open up your word that you gave to us as a gift, that it would come alive and speak to us, and that, that Lord, that we would, we would get a grasp of what Jesus meant when he said to his disciples, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let your word come alive, dwell within us, let your Holy Spirit do his work, and Father, even as we worshiped, we I sensed your presence and so and, and your Holy Spirit already beginning to move in lives. So I pray that you would allow us to remain open and honest to ourselves. I pray this in your name. Amen. Blessed are those who mourn. When I when I first read that section, I was like, oh, this is an awesome section of scripture. 
I, this is like a warm and fuzzy section of scripture. Blessed are those who mourn. And I could like talk to you and go, we've all lost something, right? And we're all in pain. We've all experienced grief and we've all mourned the passing of someone we love. God loves you and will comfort you in the midst of that pain. And, you know, you get a little goosebumpy, and it's like, ah, oh, that's so awesome. And they kind of put together a story about it and, and going. And, you, and, and as a pastor, you know, you have certain check marks. And part of the check marks, like, okay, how do, I, how do I knit this thing together? And so you create this section of Scripture, and, 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 and you know that in the Bible, God does comfort the brokenhearted, right? David writes that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And I'm like, oh, see, perfect. This is going to be an awesome Sunday. It's wonderful. Except that I discovered that that's not what God's talking about in here. Like, bummer. That when Jesus talks about, blessed are those who mourn, he's not talking about mourning in the sense that we would know it contextually in our own civilization or society where we mourn loss. It's more of a lament. Like, blessed are those who are brokenhearted because they realize that their actions has affected those around them. That blessed are those whose hearts are broken for their own sinfulness. Where's the fun in that? And I thought, wow, these guys are going to be all sorts of happy that they're in church today. Blessed are those who mourn. And that's when I started thinking about my kids and the difference between a child and a parent and the difference between me in my youthfulness and me in my, at times, maturity. You see, because as a child, even when we do wrong, we only think in the terms of, of the event and the action and the and the and the um, momentary stupid that permeates us, right? And as children, and even as teens, we can look back as adults and go, wow, that was dumb. We can even go so far as to, to remember what we told our moms and dads when we were being stupid. Hey, you did it. But there's something that happens, right? There's something that occurs as this switch that happens between a childhood and adulthood, between, between immaturity and maturity that, that Jesus writes of. Like, Blessed are those who mourn. Happy is the man. Joyful is the man. Content is the man whose heart breaks for his own sinfulness. Come on, man, Jesus is like lacking oxygen here. The mountain must have been higher than what I thought the, the Beatitudes were because that makes no sense to me. But the very essence of the Beatitudes is countercultural. It is against and does not fit into society's norms. And, and we looked at last week, blessed are those who are utterly dependent on God, who can't do anything apart from God because theirs is the kingdom of God. And now we look at blessed are those whose heart breaks for their own wrongness because they shall be comforted. If there's ever been a countercultural two-section part of Scripture, it's this. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 22, 54 through 62. Luke 22, 54 through 62. This is a story after Jesus is, is um, taken at Gethsemane to go to his crucifixion. The, the disciples fled, but Jesus, or, or that Peter, is following him at a distance. And, and John writes, he says, they seized him and led him away. Or Luke writes, they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled the fire, the crowd that was following this Jesus in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looking closely at him, said, this man was also with him. But he, Peter, denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. And this section of Scripture gives us a picture of the impact sin does in our lives. Right? The first thing sin is always about is it reinforces our own selfishness. 
How many times when we do, right before we make a choice, like, I deserve this. Just lighten up, man. It's only a choice. It's not hurting anyone. That's a phenomenal, repetable phrase. Or it's only going to be for a day or a night or a week. So sin births selfishness. All right, and a little while later in verse 58, someone else saw him, Peter, and said, you're one of them. And Peter said, man, I'm not. So see, selfishness not only is, is myopic, but it, it, it creates this thing where you begin to deny the very things that you hold most dear. You begin to deny what you value. Stupid choices are made in the context of going, I got to forget something. But if I'm going to go, go do something idiotic, I have to lay aside something that I value. Maybe it's my upbringing. Maybe it's like, I know the old man said this, but I just don't care. Or I'm going to make a choice to get involved or hook up, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to disassociate myself or deny the very things that made me who I was. That makes sense? And then it goes in at verse 59, it says, and after an interval of about an hour, and you can imagine being Peter, right? Peter sits down. He's got some young guy. Like, hey, you're one of them. He's like, I am not. And a little while later, aren't you one of them? No, man, I'm not. And then about an hour later, sitting around the same fire, wondering what's happening to Jesus, but hiding. Said another still insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. You see, by selfishness and denial, the impacts that sin has in the life of a believer is profound because it begins to destroy the person God created you to be. It begins to destroy the person God created you to be. You see, we look at, at, at choices as events and we grieve as children on being caught in the event or just the event of itself and we don't see the long-term impact that that event has in our character. And the reason a parent, a dad, and mom get so fired up at watching the repetitive failure of a child is not because they like, you're going to remove yourself from them or to take life away from them. It's because you know that that choice is going to leave a mark. Right? You sit back and you're like, oh, man. I can't stop you from doing this. But God, that's going to hurt you for a long time. That's going to just, just, just cripple you. And I think that's what breaks God's heart. As new believers, we sit back, and even as, as, as people that have sat in church and, and interacted with God for a period of time, when we find ourselves caught in this rut of habitual behavior of addictions or bad choices over and over again, we look at it and we like, it's just me, man. I'm weak. And we think and we go, like, God, you're just uptight. We, we talk to God like we talk to our dad. Hey, chill out, man. I know you were stupid just like I was stupid. You don't say that to God, but you kind of have that mentality of why is it such a big deal? But God heartbreak because he's got going, no, oh, my son, my daughter, that is going to leave such a mark. And it's going to destroy the very thing that I created you to be. And the, the transition as a child to a man, as a child to a woman, is what we see in, in verse 59, 60, and 61. It says, there comes a point in life when that reality takes root. It says, then immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. You see, Jesus had told Peter, Peter stood up. He's like, I'm never going to do any of this, man. I'm going to die with you. I'll fight for you. And Peter, or Jesus, before any of this happened, turned to Peter. He's like, buddy, you're going to deny me three times, man. 
Satan's seeking to sift you. Satan wants to mess with you and to basically destroy you. You're going to deny me. And it says, and then Peter denies it, but in the midst of this night, it says, and the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I don't think Peter wept because he got popped. I don't think Peter wept because he got caught. I don't think Peter wept because his Savior like looked at him and went, oh, Dad, I got caught. I lit the trash can on fire. I think in that moment, Jesus grasped the pain that his Savior must be feeling. I think in that moment, Peter mourned. Peter's heart broke, not because of his failure, but because of what his failure inflicted on the one that would die for him. That's mourning. To mourn is not to feel bad for an action or the consequences, but to have your heart broke because of the impact it had on a relationship. To, to mourn is to acknowledge that my actions have hurt the God who so loved me that he sent his son to die for me. To mourn, to weep, to turn around and go, I just did that, didn't I? And, and to see the look on a God's face who so loved me, Dave, that he willingly went fully God, divested himself, became a man and would hang on the cross for me and yet I failed him. I jacked him up. I let him down. I disappointed him. Well, this morning... It did. And, and, and looking at this section of scripture, it's like, that's a heavy topic, right? Like David understood this when he, he, he looks at, he, he, he's faced with his sin with Bathsheba and he says, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me and against you, O God, and only you have I, have I sinned. And yet God in his grace and his mercy doesn't just let us bake there, right? God in His grace and His mercy tells us, blessed are those who mourn for, for they shall be comforted. Oh God, thank You for that. Oh God, thank You for that. So comfort implies not just a hug and a pat on the back. Comfort implies like words and actions to pick you up and move you forward. Comfort implies being there in the midst of it. God comforts those who have wronged him. I thought that like, man, God, what do you want to do this week? Oh, uh, worship team, can you guys come forward? So here's the tension. When we wrong, when we sin, we have a tendency as humanity to revert back to the life that we knew before we sinned. To revert back to the life that we lived before we knew Jesus. Because we play this stuff out when, we, when our hearts break, when we grasp what we did to God because of our own sinfulness, we run away and weep bitterly. That's what we do. When we mourn, there is, a, there is a breaking and a severing and a fear that my relationship with God is irrevocably broke. Not because of His holiness, but because of my stupidity. And we begin to play out like, God, you're never going to forgive me because of what I did. You see, what we find Peter doing is that we, don't, we can't crawl into his head because Scripture doesn't tell us that. But in 21 of John, we find him fishing. He went back to what he was before Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee and said, follow me. That's so what he like, okay, I'm stuck. And, and, and if I could be so bold to go, it probably is not hard to figure out. I was like, man, I jacked up. Man, he looked at me. And I denied him three times. 
man, I'm done. I better go figure out a way to make a living because I'm definitely not going to be the rock on which Christ built his church because he's got more sense than that. I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to experience this relationship I had with my savior because I failed him. And I had to hurt him. And God, you know I never meant to hurt you, but I did. So I'm going to return back to what I was and yet blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Because after that, it says in 21 Peter was fishing, and what does Jesus do? And I love this picture because it gives me so much hope. The resurrected Lord and Savior, the conqueror of death and the grave, the one who died for me so that I might have forgiveness of sin, that Jesus, fully God, shows up on a beach and cooks breakfast. I go home. And scripture tells us that, that Jesus or that Peter saw him and jumped out of the boat, ran to him. And there on that beach they had a conversation, and we know the story. It's Jesus says, Hey, do you love me? And if again, if I could I could add, it's like, you love me, or are you gonna still be selfish? Do you love me? Or are you gonna deny the things that you value? Do you love me? Or are you going to allow this choice to destroy the person that I created you to be? And Peter responds to, to Jesus by saying, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. I prayed a lot this week about today. Because it's a hard section of scripture to teach in today's world. But God, what do you want to do with this? And this is what I believe he showed me. Some of you have went back to the life that you lived before your failure because you interpret your failure as a severing of a relationship with the God that so loved you that he sent his son to die for you. And so you find yourself in the boat Hoping beyond hope that God would invite you back home, but knowing in your heart that there's no way because you screwed up. God ain't going to forgive that one. And this morning, what I would encourage you to consider is that you're not here for a chance or by, by happenstance. That you're here because Jesus is showing up on the beach of your life, cooking your breakfast, wanting to have a conversation with you. Not to condemn you, but to ask you. Are you going to allow this choice or these choices or these habits or these addictions to destroy the man or the woman that he created you to be? It says when Peter got out of the boat, he had this conversation and then history reflects a man that would become the rock on which Christ would build his church. He would become the one that Jesus saw three years previous. He would become everything that God had created him to be because he allowed himself to be comforted by the one that he did wrong to. And God in his mercy and Jesus in his grace does the same thing this morning. You sit in a boat and he's like doing what you always do. And if you look up and, and even now you feel the Holy Spirit stirring in your hearts. And you're like, is that you? And I want to say, absolutely. That's Jesus on the horizon. That's Jesus lighting a fire. That's Jesus laying fish on the fire. That's Jesus cooking you food because he yearns to have a relationship with you again. He yearns that. And there's nothing that you have done that can negate the reality of that breakfast. And there's nothing that you have done that can negate the reality of his comfort and his grace. So great is his love for you. So, 
Here's where it's going to get interesting. We're going to worship. And if you've been in this church any length of time, you know I normally don't do this, but this morning I feel like I need to do this. Just like the courage it took G Peter to jump out of the boat, swim to the shore, and meet his Savior on the Savior's ground, so you need to get out of your seat and come down. That sheer act is not an act of attrition, but it is acknowledgement. It's like, man, it's like turning around knowing that Jesus is looking at you, but not running away bitterly, but coming to him so that you can be comforted. So that you can be reminded of the life that he created you for, the love that he gives you, the hope that he has embedded in your heart.